Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm a producer with The Agenda with Steve Pakin. And as part of The Agenda and TVO's contribution to the global cross-media series, Why Poverty, I'm joined today by Andrew Jackson. He is a senior policy advisor with the Broadbent Institute. Uh, Andrew, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Glad to, glad to have you here. I wanted to start by um, asking um, about your recent report. You released a report, the Broadbent Institute, uh, called Towards a More Equal Canada. The focus of that report was income inequality. Why has the Broadbent Institute decided to uh, focus on income inequality as such a concern right now in Canada? Well, certainly, I think the, the interest of Canadians in the inequality issue was uh, very much raised by the, the Occupy movement in the United States. And, and, and what, what we've seen in the United States and in, in, in Great Britain and in Canada is a, a huge increase in the, the distance between the very top of the income distribution, the very rich, the very affluent, if you wish, and the middle class and those at the bottom of the income and wealth ladder. So the concern about poverty is usually about the gap between those at the bottom and those at the middle. But, you know, it's important, I think, to look at that in the context of, of that growing gap between the rich and the rest of us. And the reality is in, in Canada over the last uh, 30 years, really going back to the early 1980s, uh, a huge share of all of the income gains that we've seen uh, from our economy over that very long period of time have, have gone to the very top, the, the top 1%, and within that, the top one-tenth of 1%. And that certainly left less resources for uh, for people in the middle and those at the bottom. And I think one outcome of that increasing inequality is uh, much less uh, willingness on the part of middle-class citizens to pay for the social programs uh, that we need because they have been squeezed. It's also read to a phenomenon that I describe as the, the secession of the affluent where the, those at the very top of the income and wealth distribution feel less and less detached from the fate of everybody else. And again, uh, you know, that undermines uh, our willingness as a society to, to support those at the bottom. So, so I think inequality is a, crucial issue in terms of how we respond to poverty as issue and, and understand poverty. Yes, and I guess I should uh, underline that while we're discussing this in the context of our series Why Poverty and obviously income inequality affects uh, the poor, uh, this is an issue that uh, the Broadbent Institute feels is not just about the poor but also how it affects the middle class. Um, on that, income inequality isn't, at least theoretically speaking, intrinsically a problem. An example would be you have two people, one person makes $75,000 a year, the other person makes $20 million a year. That's, there's a huge income inequality gap there, but the person who makes $75,000 is probably doing well enough to sustain themselves, sustain their families, and to uh, have a, a decent future. So why are you so concerned about in income inequality in Canada right now? What is it about income inequality in Canada right now that you think is actually really detrimental both to the poor and the middle class? Well, certainly there's a, there's a certain level of in income inequality that is, uh, that is functional, and we, we acknowledge that in the report. I mean, we live in a market economy. Uh, incentives uh, certainly play an important uh, role there. Uh, we certainly don't believe everybody should be paid the same. When people should be rewarded for their, uh, their contribution, their effort, their, their skills. I mean, what's what's really disturbing is uh, is the fact I think that as our economy has grown, as productivity has increased, that ha that hasn't led to a broadly based increase in living standards where everybody in society, including those at the bottom, uh, would benefit from the overall increase of economic well-being, just because so much of it has gone to the the very top. So. You know, as far as 90% of Canadians are concerned, it's almost as though there's been no economic progress at all uh, for, for an extended period of, um, of time. I guess some people argue that we shouldn't run it, worry about inequality, we should just worry about poverty and, and that we could be using the increased wealth we've seen, certainly the increased income and wealth over a long period of time, 
to support those at the bottom. But it's, it's very interesting, I think, if you compare countries, it's, it's the most equal societies, you know, particularly countries in, in Northern Europe, um, which are the most equal before we look at the role of income taxes and transfers, you know, social programs. So if we just look at the, the market and what it distributes, it's the most equal countries that actually end up spending the most on equalizing social programs and public services. And it does seem that there's something about a society that's relatively equal before government plays a role that makes people more equal to share through the government. And, you know, in the abstract, you know, we could ask the very rich in the United States and Canada to pay more in taxes and to assist those at the bottom. But, you know, the, the support of the affluent for those kind of programs to to diminish in highly unequal societies. So, so I go back to the, the important point of it. I think inequality is subversive of the sense we should have in a democratic society of some commitment to the welfare of all, to commitment to common purposes, overall social well-being. Mm. Um, I believe you're, in your report you stated that in Sweden the top 1% has about 7% of all annual income. Uh, in Canada, I believe it's about 14% and um, the United States about 18%. And feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that. But based on those numbers, obviously we're not nearly as equal as uh, a place like Sweden, but we're not at, at, the very, at, this, at the same level as the United States where you've seen the most concern about income inequality. So while we're not doing as well as some countries in terms of equality, are we really at what evidence is there that we're at a crisis level where income inequality really needs to be addressed in this country? Well, I, I don't think there's any single ratio there that's uh, the trigger. I think uh, in, in the case of Canada, it's true we are somewhat more equal still than the United States. We probably be, we started significantly more equal than the United States back in the, uh, the 1990s. The, the OECD, actually, their recent uh, major report on inequality actually said that Canada becoming, becoming more unequal at a faster pace than almost anybody else since the, uh, since the early 1990s. Um, but I, I, I guess one important point that comes out of your question as well, I think when we compare countries, it's, it's not just the... Uh, uh, the gap between uh, the top 1% and, and everybody else that's important. It's, it's what is the gap between the middle class and those at the bottom. And again, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, Germany, the, the gap between the bottom 10%, say, and those in the, in, the, uh, in the middle class is much narrower than it is in the case of Canada and, and the United States. So, you know, both of, both of those gaps are, are important of concern. So certainly... We're focused on the inequality issue, but the poverty is very much an important uh, aspect of inequality. Well, as you've said, uh, we are not as equal as some other countries, and your report states that we are not as equal as we used to be. Uh, so, given your concerns about what income inequality is doing to Canada, what are some of the solutions you would like to see um, governments uh, and uh, people undertake to uh, have a not completely equal but more equal society? Well there's a menu of options. I, I think where I'd start and perhaps most importantly is uh, we have to get the initial distribution of income by the market uh, to, be, to be more equal in the first place. So people think if you talk about inequality you're, you're immediately jumping to taxes, social programs is the answer, and that they're an important part of the answer. But um, if we look at the poverty aspect of inequality, I would say a, a huge challenge in the case of Canada has been the, uh, uh, the increasing uh, numbers of the working poor. So these are people who are working often full-time on a full-year basis, but you know, if you're at minimum wage or close to it, uh, that just does not generate an income that's sufficient to get to uh, very far above the poverty line, if indeed you can get to the poverty line at all. Um, we look at other countries, you know, people at the, the lower end of the, uh, the job market still manage to make significantly more income than they do in our country. So policies like minimum wages, living wages, I think are, are a really important part of the piece. 
was just reading recently is kind of an interesting example that the living wage campaign in in um, in London and in, in Great Britain. There's now a number of major companies, including Barclays Bank, KPMG, who have endorsed the concept of a living wage, and they they've actually committed to pay not just their own workers but contractors uh, a, a wage that is actually sufficient to uh, to bring uh, a, a family ab above a poverty line. So. You know, I, I think that's part of the solution, sort of developing a, a broad social consensus in Canada that, you know, we do have a problem in terms of uh, uh, the fact that people who are working and working hard uh, can't end, make ends meet. Now, I'd, you know, I'd certainly layer on top of that. We need tax credits for, for uh, working poor families. Uh, we need, uh, I think, more progressive taxes as well. But, you know, fixing the market itself is, is an important starting point. Now, I'd like to wrap up by asking a question of how to make these solutions you propose a reality. Uh, when you ask people about income inequality and fixing it, and, and you've done this at the Broadbent Institute in, in polling, people say, yes, I, I, I do want to address income inequality. I am willing for governments to take steps to address income inequality. But it seems often the, the voting decisions people make uh, in the ballot box at election time does not necessarily lead to those types of solutions being implemented. It seems people are willing to say that when they're being polled, not necessarily right. put them put put their word their words behind it in a vote. So, is really the political will there for these types of changes in Canada right now? I think the political will is there potentially. I mean, I think certainly when people are asked whether they would themselves be prepared to pay a bit more for good social programs, decent public services that benefit everybody, there's a willingness there. I guess there's a couple of things that come into the mix. I think, um, you know, when you have a very squeezed middle class, as we have, uh, you know, when people's uh, uh, wages, incomes after tax aren't going up, you know, it, it's that much uh, tougher for people to support, you know, uh, increasing taxes that pay for social programs. So there's, there's no doubt it makes the debate more difficult than it was when we built a lot of our social programs back in the 1970s when, you know, both wages were rising and people were prepared to pay more in taxes at the same point. I, I guess the other issue, and I, I don't even really pretend to have an answer to it, but I, I think the, the right wing have actually been very successful in in propagating the notion that government is not a very effective answer and certainly uh, uh, you know people think uh, you know a lot of money that they spend in taxes does not go to good purposes and you know I, I think waste and overspending it does exist but it's a, it's a small factor in the total but um, but I mean we do need to reestablish a trust in, in government itself I think is an important part of the solution and you know, uh, uh, prosperity from the market, I think, is, uh, is important in terms of creating a, a context for progressive social change as well. All right. Well, listen, uh, I really appreciate taking the time to talk to us about this important subject. Uh, Andrew Jackson, Senior Policy Advisor with the Broadpen Institute. Uh, as I said, thanks again. Thank you very much. And uh, that concludes today's discussion. Uh, remember that you can follow more on the series Why Poverty by going to our website. That's theagenda.tv.org. You can also uh, find out more by going to uh, TVO's website, tvo.org slash whypoverty. And finally, you can also follow uh, Why Poverty, uh, the hashtag Why Poverty on Twitter. My name is Daniel Kitts with The Agenda. Thank you for joining us.